Okay, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started with our our next uh, lineup. Um, I'd, first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Titan Professional Resources, is an Oklahoma-based recruiting and staffing firm that specializes in placing professionals in the areas of IT, administrative, clerical, and um, human resources and accounting. Thanks, Titan, for being a booth-level sponsor. Um, again, everybody has uh, schedules on their table. If not, you can look it up on the Thunder Plains website. This is the A, B side, and right next to us is the CD. It's a little bit backwards, so it's easy to get confused. Um, uh, our next speaker is Alex Revere. Um, he's a senior front-end developer at NextCore Technologies and a driving force in the tech community at the co-organizer of Atlanta Vue.js meetup and the Pi ATL meetup. With a keen eye for design and a passion for bringing order to the ever-evolving world of web development, Alex has a unique perspective on a subject that often perplexes developers in small companies. Today, he's here to demystify the buzz surrounding design systems, a topic that giants like Airbnb, Microsoft, and Dropbox have often have been championing. <laughs> and explain how you can harness the power of design systems, even as part of a small team or as a lone developer. Get ready to gain valuable insights and practical tips as Alex takes us on a journey into the world of design systems tailored for the smaller players in the game. So, hello, my name is Alex Revere. On the schedule, it says that this is about systems design. It's not? But it kind of is. We're going to be talking about design systems, which is slightly different than systems design. That's OK. It got translated somewhere incorrectly along the way, and that's fine. So we're going to talk about design systems today and how you, as a developer, can leverage design systems. It doesn't need to be like some big, scary thing. Um, I do have code in my slides. So for those of you sitting on this side of the room, if you can't really read this very well, you might want to move over to this side of the room and be a little bit closer to the screen. This is your warning. Great, so uh, as stated, I don't know who wrote that intro. It was an amazing intro though, and I super appreciate it. It was great, love it. Um, I am a senior front-end developer for Nextcore Technologies. We uh, make products that are used in food manufacturing plants and uh, we like to say that we keep the world's uh, Twinkies and Cheez-Its safe. Um, and uh, I get to work with a lot of systems where sometimes I'm working by myself or I'm working with a small team of people. And we need to be able to communicate about like what colors are and what sizes are and all sorts of stuff like this. And keeping everybody on the same page is kind of difficult. Um, so this is where design systems come into play. Now, in order to talk about design systems, we really need to define what a design system is. The first time that I gave this talk was about a year ago. At that point, I was working for an agency. They had just given an amazing talk about design systems. I had like this all laid out with the design from the company and like slides that they had used and all sorts of information and quotes from the people who work there about the things. Um, then, sadly, I got laid off in January. Um, very disappointed by that. Uh, still a great company. I would absolutely work for them again. Uh, and um, I was like, I don't feel comfortable putting all of their branding all over everything. So this is still sort of a work in progress. But as part of that, I needed to be able to answer again, what is a design system? Fortunately for me, um, Dan Mall, who is a very talented individual and prolific writer and uh, speaks at great length about design systems, wrote an article about three months later that literally answers this question. So I uh, sent him an email that was very long-winded and wordy and explaining the situation is just, I just explained to you, and he replied back, yeah, you can use, you can use, you can use my article. So I'm going to sort of go through Dan Mall's article about design systems and what his definition of design systems is so that we can all kind of be on the same page about what it is that we're talking about, right? Because that's sort of, 
that's the that's the important thing. So um, Dan starts by sort of pulling from several books about design systems and what other people have to say. So here are what some authors have to say. Um, uh, Alec Kolmatova says, a set of connected patterns and shared practices, uh, coherently organized to serve the purposes of a digital product. It's a, that's a nice little like nugget of that. We also have design systems bring order and consistency to digital products. They help to protect the brand, elevate the user experience, and increase the speed and efficiency of how we design and build products. This is by Andrew Caldwell from Laying the Foundations. We also have a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together and build any number of applications by Marco Suarez. And you can sort of see sort of a trend here in some of these ideas, but they're not saying the same thing. They're sort of saying some different things, right? Um, next, we, we look at like what like industry professionals have to say about design systems. So Jeremy Keith says, components are the trees, the design system is the forest. Um, we also have Brad Frost who says, the official story of how your organization designs and builds digital interfaces, right? We have uh, Haley Hughes, who says, any set of decisions governed across an organization. Well, that's a much broader explanation of what it is, right? We also have Nathan Curtis, who says, a library of visual style components and other concerns documented and released by an individual team or community as code and design tools so that adapting products can be more efficient and cohesive. Dan then goes on to say, well, we have all of these quotes from people who really know what they're talking about. So what we really need to do is that we need to come up with a good definition. And so he defines the, he wants, he goes over and he sort of defines the word design and he defines the word system. So the definition he uses for design is by Jared Spool. Design is the rendering of intent. And he has an, and Jared Spool has an entire article just on that expression. Um, and then the definition that he uses for system is a set of things, people, cells, molecules, or whatever, interconnected in such a way that they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. Um, and this is from Donella Meadows' uh, Thinking in Systems. So we have sort of these two ideas, right? We need to be able to render the intent of what it is that we're trying to do and where you need to organize it in a way that people can use it. Now, Dan continues on, once again, I'm quoting him extremely heavily here, uh, to have a few different types of design systems. He sort of identifies six different types of um, design systems. So the first one that he identifies is brand identities and visual language. Um, and uh, it, he says, a design language refers to all of the different visual elements that make up a brand or a particular user interface design. Um, so for instance, with my personal sites that I have, we have my blog, which has a lot of handwritten fonts. You may have noticed that I have a penchant for handwritten fonts. Don't know if you saw that. Um, and so it's very colorful, it's very whimsical, it's very uh, fun. Uh, it also has, uh, you know, a lot of sort of whimsy and, and brightness to it, right? And so similarly, in a weird way, we have uh, my professional portfolio site, which um, is a little bit more professional. It has like serif fonts and stuff like that. But everything on the page is at a slight angle so that everything is set at a random angle. So as you look at it, you sort of feel uncomfortable. And that sort of, it translates over as sort of like this way of like intentionally bad design language, which is what I'm, I'm good at. Um, similarly on my quote unquote professional site, alexrevere.com, uh, the header is set at one degree off kilter on purpose. So as you look at it, you slowly go like this and tilt your head to try to fix the header on the page. But this is sort of like my visual language is I attempt to make things look bad intentionally, right? So that's my visual language, but like making a cohesive vision of what that is. Um, next up we have tools as design systems. 
Uh, Dan says that UI kits are great examples. Um, we see these a lot when we talk about software applications like Figma or Sketch, where we have these libraries of visual components that we can drag and drop into other interfaces to design those interfaces all at once. Um, he points out that Figma has design systems for Figma, where you can pull in all of these toolkits into your Figma designs and be able to drag and drop components from there into the thing that you are building. So you can have a shared library of stuff. But he also talks about component libraries and how they're sort of a way for developers to have similar tools, right? Figma is for designers to a certain extent, so component libraries are kind of the implementation of those designs. And uh, a good example of that is Chakra UI, right? It implements material design. It has, it's available for like React and Angular and Vue, like there's a bunch of different versions of it, and it's sort of very consistent in how it does things. We also have Vuetify, which is one that I really like like for view, which is, once again, it implements material design and gives you sort of this library of components that you can use and put anywhere on the page, and it just sort of works. Um, the, another thing that he identifies as being a design system is products as a design system. And this is where we get into like large corporations being like, we have bestowed upon you a design system that you can use. For instance, material design, right? Material design is the one that everybody knows because anybody who's ever looked at an Android phone has probably seen material design in action. Um, Google kind of tries to apply material design to everything that they do. Um, Salesforce has one as well, the Lightning Design System. Uh, and you know, if you're building Shopify sites, they have a design system. You want to make it feel like you're in Shopify. If you use their design system, it will feel like a Shopify product. The next design system that he identifies is process as design system. And so uh, process is, it can be an outline of all the steps. Right? It can be a very effective way that an organization scales to be more consistent. So it's the processes that you, that you do as a company, right? So for instance, let's say you use JIRA to be able to track all of your issues and like how you have your issues flow through JIRA. That can be a design system. Um, what is this one? Uh, GitHub, if you're using GitHub issues, how do you, or even just merging things from PRs, right? Like what is your branching method for Git? How do you branch things off and merge them back in? Is everybody working on the same branch? Uh, is everybody like, do you have like a process for like kicking off automations based on your PRs and stuff like that? That's a design process. Um, and sometimes it's just like, how do you communicate information with each other? Uh, and um, like being able to be on the same page and like give information to each other. How do you handle meetings? How do you handle in-person stuff? Um, the next thing he identifies is design system as a service. Uh, we've sort of kind of covered this a little bit with like material design. There's a team that maintains that, right? There's an internal team at Google whose job it is to just do material design stuff and that's it. That's all that they do. Um, similarly, uh, Wikimedia, who's the parent company of Wikipedia, they have an internal design systems company where they, or, or team that handles the design of Wikipedia and Wikimedia and all of its stuff to make it a cohesive system. Um, you can also have companies like my former employer, Trina, who make design systems to give to you to say, hey, right, so this is like business model sort of a thing. You can also hire individual developers, like my friend uh, Jimena, who she's a designer and she's fantastic and amazing, and if you need a designer, you should talk to me and I'll hook you up with her because she's looking for work. Um, so she's great and you should absolutely uh, talk to her if you're looking for a designer. And then the last one that he identifies is design system as a practice. And what he means by this is, what is the thing that you do over and over and over, right? What is the thing that is that you do every single time, every single time that you want to do something, you do this thing over and over and over. And it's maybe it's the repeated use of components and patterns. Maybe it's incorporating a particular process, incorporating interacting with a design system like an external agency. Like any way that you can do sort of any of these processes, that itself can be a design system, and it's just about the repetition of doing it over and over again. Cool? So with that, you now understand what design systems are. I don't have to explain anything else to you. 
you have full working knowledge and you can go from here and build your own design systems and you are fully confident in your ability to do that and I don't have to explain anything else, right? No, this is where a lot of talks stop. And that has frustrated me in the past. When I was trying to learn more about design systems and stuff like that, I would get to this point and I'd be like, what do I do, right? Like, how do I do this? Because I don't work at a large company. Like I said, I work with a small team, sometimes just by myself. How do I implement this if I'm just a lone developer by myself trying to get things done? How does this apply to me? How can I use this? So we're going to talk about how do I implement this? Because that's what we need as developers. We don't need theory, we need practical application. So in order to do that, we actually need to create a design system. We don't have a lot of time because it's already almost 11. So we're going to use the smallest design system we possibly can, which is a set of colors. Um, everybody uses colors and stuff, I'm assuming. Hopefully, show of hands, who here uses colors in their development work? Yeah, yeah. Have you ever referenced a color like that you need to pass to the front end if you're back end people, right? Maybe you're storing colors of like, what color is the text on this thing? What color is the button? What color is the little alert thing supposed to be, right? So we all track colors. Now, I'm going to use, because I haven't had time to write my own version of this, we're going to use the color system that my former employer used. This is Trainer's Color Palette. Um, they built it while I was there. I was part of the team that helped implement the design and like how it all works. Um, the concept was is that you could have the background be any color or be any one of these colors, and the text would always look correct on top of it. The accessibility wasn't perfect, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, so this is sort of the color palette that we were working with. I have several shades of purple. I have a couple of shades of purple, red, and green that are uh, either the foreground or the background, right? And then uh, we have this lovely like dark gray that doesn't show up fantastic on this projector screen, but it, it's a really nice, it's a choice gray. Um, now the issue that I ran into is that we used to build things on WordPress. Who here has worked with WordPress? Few hands. Who here has never heard of WordPress? Ah, good. All right, so WordPress is a blogging system. It's written in PHP. So the first thing that I need to be able to do was that I need to be able to have the colors available to me in PHP, right? Now, I'm building front-end interfaces, however, so it needs to live on top of it. So I need the colors available to me also in JavaScript. But we're also styling things. I'm not putting my CSS in JavaScript like some maniac. So I also need it available in CSS. Now, here's the thing about this is that with PHP and JavaScript, if I have it in a JSON file, right, I can access that in both PHP and in JavaScript pretty easily, right? And if I want to access it on the front end in my CSS, if I want to put it in my CSS files, that JSON file isn't going to work for me. Right? I, there's not a good path to be like import a JSON file into my SAS or my CSS without some weird transform going on that may break. Right? So I didn't like that. But if I'm on the front end, I can actually use CSS custom properties to make it consistent. Right? So I can, I can access the CSS custom properties from both front end JavaScript and uh, CSS, right? So I need, I need two versions of these numbers. Now I could be kind of like trying to maintain two separate lists and you know when I update something over here, remember to go update it in this file as well and then hope that everybody else figures out that that's how it's supposed to work. Um, but essentially what we have here is a system of design tokens. Design tokens is the word that you're looking for when we're talking about this type of stuff. We talk about design tokens. It is a token of information. This can be color, this can be width, this can be padding, this can be margin, right? This could be font family. Um, all of these can be design tokens. They are just values that we pass around to various systems in order to use them. So how do we take our design tokens and put them into two separate files? Good news. 
Somebody made a tool to do that. In fact, several somebody's made a tool to do that. There's a whole bunch of packages that do stuff like this. If you go like design token code generator, you're gonna get like, these are just the JavaScript ones. I didn't even look for ones in other languages, right? If you're doing C Sharp, I'm sure that they have some sort of thing that's magical and does this. If you're doing Java, I'm sure they also have some sort of magical thing that does this. So the one that we're gonna focus on today is style dictionary because that's what I used. I'm not saying it is the correct one to use. I am not trying to be like, it's the only way to do things. No, you can use any of these. And the process is very similar for all of them. All of them have their benefits. All of them have problems, right? So like, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a perfect system, but it works for what I needed. So the way that we, de we store design tokens is that we're going to make a design token file. This can be a single file, this can be multiple files that all get merged together eventually. But what we put in here is that we're going to take our, we're gonna make, you can make it into sections, so I'm making a colors section, right? And we're going to have our color names, such as red, blue, and green, and then you give it a value property, and this is the style dictionary specific syntax, that has the actual value that we want for the thing. So in reality, our actual file ends up looking a bit more like this. There we go. And um, it has all of those colors that I showed you before, right? It has all of our purples, pinks, and greens. And then it also has like uh, 10 shades of gray because designers go, oh yeah, 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 there's like two shades of gray. There's not, there's, there's a lot more shades of gray than that in their design and they never realize it until it's too late. So we have like 10 shades of gray in there. Um, we also have some like error state colors and stuff like that. So these are all the colors that we're working with, right? Um, and now that we have this file, we need to tell Style Dictionary, hey, I need you to turn this into some other stuff, right? This is, this is where the magic part starts happening. To use style dictionary, we need to create a configuration file for it. So this is our configuration file. This is a very minimal configuration file. You can make far more complex configuration files. But we're gonna sort of go through, I'm gonna explain what all the parts of this are. So we have our source. This is where our tokens are going to live, right? So anything that is in this, it will pick up. Anything that's a JSON file in there, it will pick up. It'll merge them all together. So I can keep my fonts in one file. I can keep my colors in one file. I can keep my padding in one file, my margins in one file, whatever, right? And it'll, it'll merge them all together and figure that out. So this is a great starting point. The next thing that we need to do is that we need to target the platforms that we want to produce code for. Now, Style Dictionary has a lot more than what I'm using here. It has stuff for Android, iOS, probably other languages as well. Like I said, I'm using WordPress, I'm using PHP and JavaScript and CSS, so I really only need two transformations. Um, the first transformation that I need, good, it's keeping up. Uh, the first transformation that I need is our uh, SCSS, so I'm actually using SAS for my styles, um, and we're gonna build it into a SAS file that I can then import into other SAS files. The other one that I need is a JSON file so that I can use it in PHP and JavaScript. To tell it how to transform it, because it doesn't know what SCSS is, we have to give it a transform group, and these are sort of predefined things that we want to do with it. So basically it says, hey, when you see a color, here's how you should interpret that color. Hey, when you see a, a width, right, change it into pixels or rems or whatever, right? And so this is a predefined set of things of like how to interpret things and hold them in memory. Um, similarly, with our JSON, there we go, uh, we have a transforms group because none of the predefined things were quite what I wanted. So I said, I'm going to create my own transform group, and so this is how you do it. So I can specify the things that I want. So for instance, uh, attributes I think are camel, no, we're doing Pascal case for stuff, for the names. Um, we're making sure that all the colors are in hex and all the sizes are in rems. So if it runs into a size of any sort, it's gonna turn it into a rem instead of pixels. Um, the colors are all gonna be in hex instead of HSL, RGB, 
OK, LCH, right? Like, whatever. Like, we're, we're not going to worry about that. We just want to keep it in our, our hex codes. And I don't remember what attribute CTI is, but I'm sure it's important. Um, the next part is, is that we need to specify where things are going to end up. So this is our build path. So that's where the files go. Speaking of files, we need to define what our files are. So we have two files here. We have, um, we're going to make a JSON file and a SAS file. And within those two files, I specify the format that I want them to come out in. So for instance, for SAS, maybe I want it just as a flat list of variables. I'm specifying here, I want it to be a deeply nested map. So I get a map that has a colors map in it, and then that colors map has all of the values that I want that are named. So I can iterate just over my colors and do something with them. Similarly with the JSON, I want that to also be a nested object so that I can, once again, iterate over the colors and do something with them. So that's our config.json file. This is, this is where the magic happens. And then the next part is the difficult part. We run a command. We run, so npx style dictionary build means that you don't even have to like npm install it because npx will do the npm install and then just run it. And we want to run the build command, which will build the files that we just told it to. And it outputs a bunch of great stuff. Look at that. Oh, wow, it's SAS. Yay, we have SAS variables that we can override if we want to. Ooh, ah, ooh. So these are the variables up here, right? We have all of our colors. But that's not very useful to me because I can't really iterate over those very well. So down here, it takes all of those and it puts them into a deeply nested map. So now I can iterate just over the colors. So I can bring this file in to any of my other SAS files and do something with it. Similarly, over in JavaScript land, we have our JSON file, which looks a lot cleaner. Um, and all of my colors are available to me in a colors object. Ta-da! So recap. We uh, needed to create a version that we can use in PHP and JS. We created a version that we can use in CSS and JS. And there are more export options available. Like I said, there are options for iOS. There are options for Android. I'm pretty sure there's options for C Sharp. Uh, and if not, then somebody has probably made it. If it's not there by default, somebody has probably made a package that can do it, because you can build your own way of exporting stuff. So if there's a language that isn't supported here, you can absolutely make your own. Do I still have time? Oh, I still have time. This is great. OK, cool. So we're going we're gonna to go a little bit further. Because we've gotten halfway there, right? We've made the, we've made the, we've made the files that we need. We can use those, right? You probably know. I think most of you probably know like how to bring in a JSON file or bring in a SAS file. But I promised you a practical implementation because we, we are developers and we need to see examples. So we're going to make a WordPress plugin because reasons. So in WordPress, we have a lovely editor for posts, blog posts, pages, Everything in WordPress is stored as a post, so basically anything that gets edited has this editor available to it. And what use is a design system with a preset set of colors if you don't have a color picker that allows you to pick those colors? So we're going to make a color picker for WordPress using the design token files that we just generated. This is going to be a lot of code, and if you don't understand PHP, don't worry. It's a terrible language. Uh, it, is, it, it, it gets weird. We'll go over it. Um, so within PHP, what I'm doing here is that I'm bringing in our JSON file. Now, this is a very complicated, convoluted function. What this does is that I'm saying read in the file and then cache it in this variable for the rest of this call. So if something else calls this function again, use the cache version. Don't go read the file again, right? I am assuming that the token.json file is not going to change mid-request. In fact, I would hate it if it changed mid-request, so please don't do that, right? So I'm, I am ensuring that it only gets read in once and then used for the rest of the use on the page. 
So that's all that this is. So whenever you see uh, TCP return design tokens, that's what it's doing. It's reading it in once and then pulling from a cache, essentially. Um, the next thing that we have is our uh, color palette. So this is how WordPress wants us to form our color palette uh, for their purposes. So I'm taking the values that we have, right? I'm taking our colors, um, and we're going to have a, a color slug and a color hex. And we're going to create a color name, which replaces any of the dashes with spaces, so that if we have, like, you know, green dash 400, it'll be green space 400, right? Uh, and we're gonna make it uppercase all the first letters so that it looks nice. Um, and then we put it into an array that has a name. Um, oh, I actually, I've highlighted some of this. This is fantastic. So we're gonna, we're gonna create a color palette from our, and we're gonna create a color palette array. We're gonna get our design tokens. We're gonna loop over those design tokens, and we're going to then put each one into our array of color palette colors. Um, and then, yeah, there we go. So we have a name, a slug, which is like a, basically the way to refer to the color to get back to our CSS part, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, the color itself as a hex value. Uh, and then we say, hey, if, you, if the color palette has stuff, because once again, PHP is a terrible language, um, we're going to add theme support for the editor color palette and put our palette in instead of the default one. So there we go. We've now replaced the colors with our custom ones. Uh, and then this call down here, because WordPress is terrible, once again, it has this whole hook system where you can kind of hook into any part of the system, which is great until you have too many plugins and then Things tend to slow down a little bit. Um, but we add it to the theme, right? So once we have the theme, we're able to add our color palette to the theme. Theme now knows it exists. Great. So the next part of this is that we need to define a bunch of CSS because the color picker in WordPress has a very specific way that it wants you to name your CSS classes. So here's our SAS file that does that. We're going, to build, we're going to bring in our variables from the build file that we have, right? We're gonna use the SAS map functions, so that's why that call is there. And, oh, nope, go back. Uh, and then over for each name and color in the map that's called colors, right, that's in our tokens, we create a class called has dash name, which is that dashed version of the name, dash color, and then we set the color to our color value. So we just create a bunch of classes for each one of the colors available, good to go. So this is all of our CSS. It spits out a bunch of classes. That's, that's the key thing here that you need to know. The last part of this is that we need to enqueue that CSS file. So in WordPress, you can just add JavaScript and CSS from anywhere, because once again, it's WordPress. Um, and so we're going to enqueue our styles and point to our, our CSS file that gets built. And we're going to have um, a, we add it to the init action and to the admin page, right? We need it on two places. We need it on the front end and we need it in the administration part. So we add our hooks there. And there we go. We have now made a WordPress plugin that uses a design system that is very helpful to you as a lone developer. There we go, that is my example, that is my talk. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them at this time. I appreciate you being here. And a big shout out, thank you to Dan Mall. <laughs> questions, anybody, anybody? Oh, WordPress is a fantastic blogging system. Do not get me wrong. Anybody who works in WordPress, it's, it's a good system to work in. It does a lot of really fantastic stuff and it has a very capable and strong ecosystem. I have seen 
things done with WordPress that should not have been done with WordPress, or they should not have been done the way that they were done with WordPress. So it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sort of like, you can do amazing things, but you can also like really shoot yourself in the foot um, pr pretty easily. So, um, so yeah, that's, I have, I have a love-hate relationship with it, so. Any other questions? I, I've, wow, it's, um, I'm amazing. It's uh, everybody, uh, and nobody has any, I have explained this perfectly, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, stop using, uh, so the question was, y you've used Wix, if you add a lot of plugins, it also slows down. Do I have any recommendations? My recommendation is don't use as many plugins. That's the, generally, generally you can find, typically there's like one, maybe two, that are really built inefficiently, right? And if you can find those and either re-implement them or like point out like, hey, it doesn't work and get them to fix it, or just not use them, like if you don't need them, get rid of them, and like that'll typically be the thing that like speeds things up. Um, so that's generally, generally speaking, it's less is more, don't, like you don't need, you don't need five different animation frameworks existing on your page to move a letter from this side of the page to that side of the page. You can probably do that with just some simple CSS. Um, so that's, that's my thoughts up there. Cool. Everybody, yes. Oh, yeah. Great, I love this. I, this is great, I love it. This is turning into a, into a fan, wonderful way for me to get uh, my thoughts out into the internet. This is wonderful. Um, so the question was, I, I've said that PHP is a terrible language and like what is terrible about it and uh, what language is better. Um, new PHP is a lot better. I started doing web development in the early 2000s. So I remember PHP 4. We're up to PHP 8 now. It's gotten a lot better. I'm gonna preface the internet. I'm gonna preface everything that I'm about to say with that. PHP has gotten a lot better. The naming for a lot of its core functions is wildly inconsistent, and a lot of them are simple wrappers around the C-level functions, and so they behave in peculiar and bizarre ways that you aren't expecting if you don't know what's happening with them. For instance, there's a lot of passing things by reference, and there are a lot of PHP developers that don't understand passing things by reference. And so you pass in a thing, it modifies it, and it doesn't return that thing back. So when you say, hey, I'm gonna put in the thing and then set the same variable as the return value, and you get a Boolean back, and you're expecting an object, it's very confusing. There's a lot of things where the naming convention is something, number two, something else, right? Instead of like doing like, so the, ex the example one is NL2BR, so new line to break tag, and that has a number two in the middle. Instead of being like new line, capital T2, break, right? It's, it, the naming of things is wildly inconsistent in that regard. Sometimes it's the word two, sometimes it's the letter two, the number two, like it's, it's all over the place. Um, it's very good at what it does, and I've seen people try to do things with it that it is not very good at and that it should not be used for. Um, and it is getting better, it is getting better every day, and so some of the problems have gone away, it's gotten a lot better. But yeah, that's generally, that's why. So, it's a, it's a, if you're working with PHP, keep working with PHP, because you can, it's a great language, it's very powerful at what it does, but man, it has some weird semantics to it. So, yeah, that's, that's my answer. Any other questions? Anything else that you want me to like have some hot takes on? I can do this all day, it's great. Um, 
Oh, what's the alternative to PHP? Great question. Um, well, I mean, I can go Python. It has its own problems too. Have you ever tried to like make something in Python and then get somebody else, like show it off to somebody else on their computer? <laughs> uh, it's a pain in the butt. Um, like it, it's one of those things where I think every single language has a lot of challenges and troubles to it. PHP is great in sort of the simplicity of like being able to take a file, put it up on a server, and like it just works. Um, but like Python, I like the syntax of Python. I like how clean it is and how consistent they are in naming things. That's a big thing to me. Um, but similarly, like C Sharp and Java, also very consistent in like their naming as far as I know. Um, and I like a lot of the patterns that those use. I don't write those languages, but when I read them, I'm like, I understand what's happening here. Um, uh, I've heard very good things about Go. I have not dug into it, but like there's so many options that it's like, there are people who do just PHP and really limit themselves. Um, and so generally speaking, like you keep doing PHP, but like learn another language too, because you might change how you write your PHP by learning another language. So that's sort of my non non-committal answer there. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes? Good question. Uh, so the question is, uh, do I have any opinions about where to keep the design tokens? Like, do I keep, do you keep it all in like the repository with your code? Do you put it in its own repository and then import it? Like, how do you go about doing that? So it depends is my senior programmer answer to that. Um, if I'm using a set of design tokens, like if, if there are two code bases, that are using a set of design tokens. I will probably move it either to its own repository and then publish packages from that, or I will make it like its own separate thing, like make like a little mono repo so that it lives on the side and then publishes a package. In my ideal world, you would just add it as another thing inside of a mono repo. I've recently worked on a distributed monolith. It made me cry a lot because it was very painful um, and but like if you're working with like multiple packages that are going to consume this if you can keep them all in the same repository it's a lot easier to keep everything in sync than having to like publish a package and then go update a version number in um, all of your uh, projects that are using it so it's a great question love that question though any other? Yes. Um, yeah, so good question. Uh, I showed the style dictionary stuff as an NPX command, and the question was, is there a way to sort of maybe work that into a build process, make that part of your package.json, whatever. Yes, you can make it part of your package.json. It can be its own little like script command in there. There are ways that you can import it and add it to a build process. The issue with style dictionary is that it is not the current version of it is not designed for um, like Webpack, Vite, what have you. It does its own reading and of stuff, modif like does the transform and then writes the files itself and doesn't integrate into like Vite where Vite is going to give you places where that's going to happen. So I haven't seen anybody write like a Webpack thing for style dictionary or a Vite thing for style dictionary. So it's a little bit harder to get it into your build process. Um, we actually ended up building like our own watcher command that would run like style dictionary and then ES build when we were doing stuff. Um, but I should look into that again because I feel like there's probably a place that you could put a style dictionary call within Vite or Webpack that on each run it would do it before everything else. 
um, and make the new build files available. So that, I think it's doable to get it into that format, but you can absolutely like make it a script and then like add it to your CI process and all of that stuff for sure. So good question. I like that one. Anybody else? Cool. Well, thank you all for coming. Hopefully this is informational and that you got something good out of it. Thank <laughs> you.